A special assistant to President Trump. He was the press secretary to Vice President Pence. He is now out of the White House, but he's a spokesman for the Trump-Pence political operation, and he's also on the Trump 2020 advisory board. Mr. Lauder, you could speak to anything officially, <laughs> I guess, is what I could do. So let me start with this. Does the president like having this unsettled environment around him? I think the president, and, and, I, and I've seen it in action, he likes to have uh, the staff competing with ideas, defending their ideas, their positions. That way he sees all sides of all of the issues, and then he makes his decision, and it's time for, it's time for everyone to execute. Is there a point, though, that it does become demoralizing? Look, you were there. You left in September 17, and we, we did this. You were there while Bannon, Priebus, Spicer, Flynn, Comey, Walsh, McFarland, Dubke, Gorka. I'll leave Comey out of this. I'm just going to do White House people. All those folks left before you left. So you've been there when there's been churn. I get the competition for ideas, but is there a point it becomes demoralizing? I, I think as long as the staff feels like that their contributions are still ma mattering, and, mm -hmm. and really, I can't tell you the number of times we would leave out of the office, usually after dark, and you'd go home, you'd turn on the news and talk to your family, and they would, you would see the stories of the chaos, but you're so insular, you're so mm -hmm. focused on whatever the task at hand is, whether it's tomorrow's meetings, whether it's the trade mission next month, uh, or something along those lines, you really become very task-oriented, and then it kind of surprises you when you see the outside's commentary on it. I want to ask you, though, about some Axios reporting. I, I referred to it a little bit in Kelly O'Donnell. Uh, apparently, the chief of staff had an off-the-record with a bunch of reporters. Axios was not in it, so they, they got reports of it, where John Kelly said the president's conversations with outside advisors, who then perhaps talked to um, members of the press, uh, have helped stir this perception. Fair? Uh, I mean, I, the president t talks to a lot of people, and I, he talks to them in, you know, at all times during the day. Many of those people still still go on and talk. I do think he likes to make sure that he keeps his staff on his toes, so they are always working to deliver the next message, the next policy idea. And when you're reading about things, I, you know, I always try to tell people in, in all walks of life, not just at the White House, when you're worried about those kinds of things, control what you can control, and that's doing the best job you can. It I'm curious, since you worked for Vice President Pence, whether you could... There's something interesting here in both Vice President Pence and the Defense Secretary, Jim Mattis. They have stayed out of the president's crosshairs. They also, what they have in common is they've kept their head down. Is that... Is that the model of how to survive in, a, in, a, in, in the way Trump likes to manage? I, I think as long as you are providing your counsel to him in private, he calls the shots, you go execute, you keep your head down like you said, and that, mm -hmm. that, is the, that is the vice president's motto. What are we doing every day to advance the president's agenda, to, to take the next policy step, or, or whether we're talking about the politics on 2018 or going around the world? I think Secretary Mattis is in very, in very much the same mold. It, it, it does seem as those that pop their head up find trouble. The key is to stay on. The key is to continue to promote the president's agenda. That's mm -hmm. something that is not going to waver with the vice president or with Secretary Mattis. How would you describe why the president wants this? Basically, what it appears to be, he wants an overhaul of his national security team. I mean, there's a. I know that there's been a framing of this as just oh, there's. But there's some. To me, there's a pattern here. He has said he wasn't happy with that. He didn't see eye to eye with Tillerson. He made that very clear, particularly on the issue of Iran. Um, it's been pretty clear that he and, and General McMaster don't always see eye to eye on policy. And General Kelly, and I mean, that's his national security team. What is he looking for from a national security team that he's not getting from Tillerson, McMaster, and Kelly? I think he wants all, uh, and I'm not going to say he's not getting it because I don't know enough to be able to say that they're not providing this to him, so I wouldn't be in the room for that. Mm -hmm. But I think what he generally wants is people to give him, give him solid ideas, options. The thing that always remarked, uh, was remarkable about the president to me was that he wanted things done yesterday. And, or he was asking, why didn't we do this yesterday? Mm -hmm. And so moving at the pace of Washington, Washington, D.C., uh, especially in some cases, especially in the national security, foreign policy apparatus, can move very slowly and deliberately. And he's more of a let's make the decision and then let's vet it and let's move on. Is the issue then with his staff more about process than it is policy? Is he, because for instance, on the trade deal, he seemed to be frustrated by the process and finally he just said, forget it. I'm just going to announce it and you guys figure it out. I, I is think, that an example of that? I, it could be, yes. Uh, I think he's very focused on what he, he knows. He's got that feeling of what he said. And I know when it comes to tariffs, that is something that he talked about on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. And he is very committed to delivering on those promises. And while he will hear all sides of the argument, mm -hmm. and, he will, and he will negotiate, and he will use that as leverage to make sure that we are getting the best trade deals possible, whether it's with the European Union, China, Canada, and Mexico, 
This is something he told the voters he was going to do, and he wants to deliver on that. What's different about the President Trump you observed in the first, say, two or three months and the President Trump you interact with now? I think the biggest thing is, is the same for everyone in the White House. Those first two or three months, you, every, everything is new. You're figuring it out for the first time, and you do have access to some some of your predecessors mm -hmm. of, of multiple administrations that will help you figure out some of the, the nuts and bolts, but you're experiencing it all from the first international trip, mm -hmm. the first State of the Union, the first, all of these are brand new. So you're trying to figure out how to just keep everything running. Now you've got your footing. You're getting in there, and now you, you, you know you've got the basics done. Now we can dig in further to the politics. So is it fair to say that this, this round of staff shakeup then that's coming, perhaps, or not, it, our experience is it's more likely to come, is about him. He's personally comfortable in his footing, so now he knows what he wants. Is that, is that, what we, we should, is that how we should read the changes, that the people he has in there now are... These are the people he's much more comfortable with than what he had in the first round. I don't want to disparage anyone who was already there, um, but I do think what we're what we're seeing with with the president is that he's customizing his team for the task at hand. So as we face new challenges going into North Korea, with the Iran deal coming up, and obviously some very shocking and disturbing allegations coming out of what Russia's doing right now, he wants to make sure that he has his team, whether it be with the new state uh, secretary of state, with the director of the CIA, in place, speaking with his voice knowing exactly what he wants to do and then getting and then moving forward from there. All right. You're on the 2020 advisor board. You're part of the Trump Pence political operation. So your read on Pennsylvania 18, it seems as if the most Republicans view it as a big negative. The president is trying to deflect like, wait a minute, you know, I, I think I helped. I didn't hurt. Is that really your assessment here? Or do you think it's a because you have a Carl Rove who believes that the president's presence did more for Democratic turnout than it did for Trump turnout? Uh, I can't make the argument on that. I think one of the things we're doing is we might be overanalyzing just the broader tea leaves. And there were some very local issues in that race that I think uh, it's very high union membership mm -hmm. in, in that district. The previous Republican uh, uh, Congress, scandal. he had very, but right. he had longtime ties to, to labor. And so did Connor Lamb, where Rick Saccone actually had a history in the state legislature of opposing union uh, back to Pennsylvania Republicans are usually you have pro labor Republicans. Right. So, so you I think, think his anti union background cost him unique. I think there were a number, of, including the fundraising aspects and some other elements, but I don't think he might have been the right match for that district. Right. But do you guys take any nervousness away from this? I think the big thing I'm more nervous about is if you're an incumbent or you're a challenger, mm -hmm. raise money, knock on doors, do the basic blocking and tackling. The RNC, the president, vice president, and the NRCC cannot come and save every single person. You've got to do it yourself. The president of the United States didn't like when the RNC, he thought the RNC was meddling in the presidential primaries. Why is he getting involved in Senate primaries in Nevada? Uh, I believe he thinks that this is the best chance for us to keep the seat, the Senate seat, and to take that House seat uh, by having two great candidates running. Is he going to get involved in more the, primaries? Is he going to try to clear the Arizona field? Is he going to try to clear the Mississippi fields? Is he going to try to clear the Tennessee? I think he'll take a look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. This was unique in the fact that there was another race that uh, Tarkanian could get into where he would, uh, we would have the benefit of both, both of them if they win. All right. Mark Louder. Uh, Former special assistant to the president, now on the outside, and probably liking that someday. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Lauder, thank you very much. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.